Nolene, once again, and greetings to all who care and dare to listen. It's four o'clock in the morning on the 26th of July, 2022. That's the chair creaking. And I'm sitting here with the waning moon just before dawn. The waning moon will appear. It's a crescent in the east. It's called the crescent of the left hand because when you hold up your left hand and you make a, an arc or a curve with your forefinger and your thumb, it mimics the shape of the moon. The sunset crescent that you see in the west at the beginning of the lunar cycle is called the crescent of the right hand because you make that mimicking gesture with your right hand. These lunar cycles have deep significance in planetary tantra in the practices that I do and others do and have been doing around the world for some years now. So we speak of the last seven days of the lunar cycle as uh, being in completion. Specifically, you are in completion with the Dakini or Devata who oversees that monthly cycle. And how can you identify who that is? By who, I mean that radiant emanation, that's what devata means, that radiant emanation, which is a frequency of the earth itself, and from one month to the next, although all of her 16 frequencies are constantly radiating, from one month to the next, one particular frequency tends to dominate, and you can identify which one that will be by looking at where the crescent moon in the west, the new moon, stands against a constellation because each of the 13 constellations in the sky correspond in one way or another to these devatas, which are telluric frequencies of the Earth Mother. So we say that in the last seven days of any shift, we're in completion with the Devata who oversees that shift. In this case, that would be Idris. Her name is Idris. It's actually a name from Welsh lore. It's the name of a powerful witch and also of a powerful place in Wales. So here I am, all by my lonesome, sitting here in completion with Idris. And it occurred to me to tell you that love is the serene ocean that rocks your heart. Now why on earth, you might wonder, did it occur to me to say that in just that way? Well, these things do happen when you follow the practice of planetary tantra and you attune to these frequencies of the aeonic mother, call her Gaia, call her Sophia, call her Gaia Sophia, call her Pam, which means planetary animal mother. Over time, as you attune to her frequencies with the instrument of your body, which is designed to receive and transmit them, it gets rather sensitive. I speak of Dakini instruction, 
And Dakini instruction is something that emerges in your own mind due to the fact that it isn't your own mind, you see. So your intelligence is simply a modality or a limited, what is the word, a limited transceiver of the mind of the earth itself. And so some things that happen in your mind are actually due to her mind happening in your mind. And you can detect this. You can avoid auto-suggestion, make-believe, magical thinking, pretending. And you can learn to know the difference between what is a pretended or apparent event of Dakini instruction and what is really a truly provable event of subliminal transception. So I suppose you could say that I'm in completion with the address and in some manner as I steep my body deeply in the cellular nectars that gather at the sublime moment of the waning moon, I guess you could say that that phrase came to mind sort of along those lines, if you follow my drift. Now, I find, curiously, and I have been talking about love off and on lately for a while. Well, I certainly talk about self-love quite a bit on Nemeta and on various talks. And I'm surprised. I'm amazed. You could say that I have disarmed myself. You know what it feels like to be disarmed by someone? Well, to me, when I talk about love, it's as if I'm disarming myself. I really don't have a strong inclination to talk about love. I don't want to influence anyone with my personal views on love. But it just comes up now and then. And it came up this evening to tell you that love is the serene ocean that rocks your heart. And I could just stop there and that would be the end of this recording and maybe it would be better because even though I have allowed myself, permitted myself to talk about love recently over the last few years, I'm still reticent. You know, I'm no authority on love. I would never claim that. And my experiences have been my experiences, uh, I would never presume that what I have learned or gathered from my experiences of love would uh, apply to anyone else or even be valuable to anyone else. I haven't, really. Nevertheless, there comes and goes this compulsion to say something about love. And that is what has happened tonight, this morning, in the dawn hours before the rise of the sunrise crescent. So, what do I do now? Shall I elaborate? Actually, I don't really want to elaborate. What I'd rather do is just tell you a little anecdote and then tell you something else. So here's the anecdote. About a month ago, I was sitting around in the place where I can be found, and it must be true because it rhymes, with three other people. We were in the kitchen. It was in the morning. And I popped out a question. I said, define love. Give me your definition of love. We're just sitting there having coffee in the morning. 
casual moment. Well, they gave their descriptions. They told me what they think love is. They described their conceptions of love, all three of them. And then, of course, the conversation came around to me, and it was my turn to say what I think love is. And I said, emptiness. So that's the anecdote. Now, maybe that needs commentary. Maybe I would be better having made that assertion that love is emptiness if I explain myself, you know, if I made at least some kind of commentary about that statement. But I'm not going to do that. Instead, I'm going to tell you a little parable. It has rather a long title, but it's short. The title is The Lotus on the Ocean of Supreme Bliss. Now, in order to uh, tell this parable, I invite you to envision the ocean with me. What does the ocean of supreme bliss look like? Well, suppose that we're kind of floating over the surface of a vast body of water, like the ocean, like you can see if you're out far out in the sea where there is no land. We can see, you can see, all around, full circle, 360 degrees, to the rim of the ocean, which of course has no rim. And to assist the visualization while we uh, kind of picture ourselves, you know, floating over it and looking down. Now this is a deep ocean and it contains a lot of power. So it can be enormously turbulent and there can be massive waves rolling across the ocean, massive swells. But as you and I see it now, strangely perhaps, it is perfectly calm. And the surface of this ocean of infinite bliss is as smooth as a black mirror, like a calm lake. But it is an infinite ocean of infinite depth. Never forget that. And there, floating in the center of the ocean, is a large white lotus. Now, let's hone in and look at what the lotus is doing. It's floating, not moving, but just floating in one position on this mirror-like, perfectly flat, serene surface of an infinite ocean of infinite depth. And as we look at it, we notice that it does what lotuses do. And what do lotuses do? What do hearts do? What does your heart do? Well, it opens and it closes, doesn't it? Now, of course, the physical heart also opens and closes. It has those two actions. What are they called? The systole and the diastole, something like that. So your heart beats. And the chambers, the four chambers, open and close. But of course, the lotus is a lotus. It's a flower that's capable of closing up into a tight vertical column. And then it's capable of opening and spreading its petals so that they are fully open and fully horizontal. So picture those two 
actions of the lotus. It closes tightly and then it opens broadly and it closes and it opens as it floats on the ocean of infinite bliss. But what exactly is this lotus doing? And what does its opening and closing have to do with where it is? on that ocean. Why does the lotus open? And then why does it close again? Why doesn't it just remain entirely closed or entirely open? What about this mysterious behavior of the lotus? Well, the parable says that the lotus, flower, petals, contain dew and pollen. So imagine that there is dew, which is wet, and pollen, small particles, which are dry or moist, and they collect on the petals of the lotus. So what happens when the lotus closes is, of course, it encapsulates the pollen and the dew and protects it and keeps it sealed. That is the sealed lotus. But then when the lotus opens, well, the dew and the pollen on the petals are exposed and they can drift away. The dew can evaporate and the pollen can drift away. So you could say that the lotus has a purpose because every time it opens, it lets the dew and the pollen loose. And so every time it opens, it releases those precious substances that are collected on it, on the petals. But then again, when it closes, it gathers up those same, those same precious substances. The dew that might be compared to the nectars of life, the water of life, the water in your body, the liquid element and the pollen that might be compared to carbon dust, stardust, as it has been called. So the lotus does this, and the parable wants you to ask a question. How does the lotus feel when it's doing this, and how do you feel when you are doing the equivalent Well, it's quite simple. When the lotus is closed and all the petals are folded together in a vertical shape, it obviously is holding dew and pollen, which it has collected, which it has gathered. Then when it opens, it releases it. So each time it does that, there is less and less dew and pollen on the petals. In fact, the action of opening for the lotus is a deliberate act of releasing those precious substances. But then why would it close again? Why would it ever close again? Well, suppose that it opens fully, the petals are horizontal, they're spread out, there it is floating beautifully on the still surface of the serene ocean of bliss, which is also the serene ocean that rocks your heart. And although it's open and although it has opened many, many times as maybe, who knows, maybe your heart has, has it really genuinely, truly opened? 
Well, if it has, it has released something like pollen and nectar into the world. But then why would it ever close again? How does the lotus feel? What does the lotus feel that causes it to close again? Well, the parable says that it closes as long as it still has some pollen and dew to release. The very fact that some pollen and dew, like a residue, still remain on the petals of the lotus causes it to close. But then, because the lotus finds its greatest joy in release, it opens again and it releases more pollen and more dew. And it goes on and on. But does it ever stop? Does it ever happen that the lotus finally opens and it never closes again? Could that happen to you? Could that happen to your heart? What conditions would be required? Well, it's quite simple. In order for that to happen, your heart would need to be empty enough so that it never has to close again. So there is the lotus, and there is love as emptiness. But you know, really, let's get real, let's talk about how it actually is for the human animal. No, love is a pulse, you feel a pulse, you feel a throb of love. And your heart feels a throb of attraction, repulsion, giving, taking, having, not having. And where does this pulse come from? Could it be that there is a pulse, there is an influence upon the lotus that endows it with the tendency to act in this way, to open and close until it is so empty that it never has to close again? Is there some influence? Well, there is. And that influence comes from the depths of the ocean of bliss. You see, the surface of the ocean is serene, like a flat mirror, and the depths of the ocean are infinite, even though you know that there is great power in those depths, the power to release tremendous waves and turbulence. But even that power comes out of the depths of the ocean, and there in the infinite depths is something that we tend to call love pulsating, and as that pulsation reaches the lotus, the lotus responds by opening and closing until, yeah, third time, you've got it, until it is so empty of the precious pollen and dew that it never has to close again. And that is how the serene ocean affects the lotus. And that is how it rocks your heart. And who knows, maybe, even maybe, that's why it rocks your heart. 